Hello and welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. I'm Malcolm Borthwick, Editor of Intellectual Capital at Bailey Gifford. If something is scarce, it's usually valuable. That benefits whoever's in control. But if it becomes abundant, things change. Think what happens, for example, to oil and gas producers when you get your power from renewable energy. Or cinema owners as you stream the latest films into your homes. Learning's another example. Universities and schools have taught classes in a standardised fashion for centuries. A teacher in a room delivers a set course over a set time to a small group of students. But now technologies in the form of the internet, AI and apps give you other ways to learn. To discuss some of the companies transforming education, I'm joined in our Edinburgh studio by Taiha Wien. She's an investment manager involved in the Keystone Positive Change Investment Trust and the Positive Change Fund. But before we start the conversation, some important information. Please remember that, as with all investments, your capital is at risk and your income is not guaranteed. Taiha, thanks very much for joining us in the studio. It's exciting to be here in the Edinburgh studio, and this is our 25th podcast. So thanks for joining us in short briefings on long-term thinking. Thanks, Malcolm. It's, it's definitely my pleasure to be here. And I um, can't believe that it's 25th podcast already. Um, so it's definitely a great honour. <laughs> Thanks very much, Taiha. So if we could just start by setting out what the problem is here and the solution that's being provided. Education is a very broad area. So uh, let me focus on higher education only for for the conversation today. And I think For learners in higher education, the motivation to study beyond just pursuing new knowledge is actually to earn a better job and higher income in the future, right? That's the economic motivation. And that is why education has a signaling purpose. It signals the employability of learners. And that is also why credentials are so important. For a long time, universities are the monopoly of credentials. And education is sort of a scarce resource. And like you said earlier, right, if something is scarce, it's expensive. And that is true in education. There is just a limited growth in the supply of higher education because university teaching is not scalable. For decades, the classroom only can hold a certain number of students and the teacher's capacity to teach is only confined to the size of that classroom. But at the same time, you have increasing demand for education. So that has caused an escalation in costs. And in fact, if we look at the um, U.S. college tuition fee, then it almost quadrupled since 1980s compared to just the doubling in healthcare costs. And so what I see as a challenge to our education system at the moment is that you have a very high cost for education and a system that is not scalable, that is not accessible uh, for everyone. A system that is unscalable unless there's change by the science of things. Yeah, and I think when there are challenges, there is going to spur innovations. I think what are happening in education at the moment is that education may become less of a scare resource over time. And there are two reasons for that. I think the first one is that universities may no longer be the only credentials providers anymore. And why is that? Because like, if you think about it, the world is changing really fast with a rapid technology development. And universities struggling to keep up with the contents that make their students employable. And so What happened is that employers are now directly joining the market to fill in that skill gaps themselves. And so companies like, you know, Google, like IBM, like Microsoft, etc., they have launched and taught their own degrees that are now considered equivalent to university degrees. And increasingly, universities adopting those courses developed by employers into their own curriculums. And the second thing that I think is changing is that the distributions of education. And here I'm talking about the internet and online education. If you think, again, then the the cost of giving online lecture to an extra student is virtually zero. And so like everywhere else we have seen across the economy, the internet has a powerful deflationary impact, which I think will make education a lot cheaper and a lot more accessible um, in the future. Historically or traditionally, education has been a bit of a graveyard for investors. So what's changed? It's interesting because 
for a long time, we wanted to find. I mean, for investors, we want to find good companies and good investment opportunities at the same time. But it seems to be quite hard in education, and like you say, is it often edtech is often considered as a graveyard for investors. And I think the reason for that is because it is really difficult to balance the missions that these education companies want to achieve. In the form of like lowering costs and improving accessibility, with the desire to be profitable. And Taya, let's come back to that idea of balancing profitability and, and mission a little bit later. But first, I wanted to focus on some of the companies that you're invested in, which you're excited about. Yeah, sure. Um, so we have three education companies in the portfolio, which are Coursera, Duolingo, and FDM. I think the audience are all very familiar with Coursera. So let's start with with Coursera. Then, Coursera has the largest library of mock or massive open online courses that I'm sure many of you have tried at least one before. Coursera fits really well with some of the changes that I talked about earlier. So it, it has three business lines. The first one is called Coursera for Consumers, in which it provides thousands of short online courses for consumers like you and me, which I think is will benefit from the desire for lifelong learning to remain relevant in the ever-changing job market. The second business is called Degree, in which Coursera works with you universities to help university provide online degree for the students. And that will benefit from the shift to online education, which now has become a must-have rather than just a nice-to-have for most of the universities. And the third business is the enterprise business in which Coursera provides online courses for the employers and governments to help them upskill their workforce. And what is so exciting about Coursera in my mind is the fact that its open platforms involve the major stakeholders in the education system, who are the educators, the learners, and the institutions that employ them. And they work really well with all those parties. And it's sort of like a feedback loop because the more learners you have, the better you can attract educators and employers and and that works in virtuous cycle and for positive change Coursera is a positive change company because it has the potential to bring better accessibility to education lower the cost and at the same time providing qualifications that are relevant for people who want to remain relevant in the job market and what's the scale of the opportunity for Coursera the skill is, I say, massive, isn't it? Like, if you think about education, it is one of the biggest sector. is a two trillion US dollar market opportunity, and online degree is estimated to be about forty billion US dollar at the moment, and rising to like eighty billion by twenty twenty five. So that is just some enormous number, right? But I think what is really exciting for me is that the market opportunity can be very dynamic. So if you buy into the argument that we're going to live for longer, um, we're going to work for longer, we're not going to retire when we reach like 65 years old. Maybe we work until we 80 years old. And we're going to keep learning because not just because we want to have new knowledge, but also because we want to remain again, relevant in the fast-changing job market, then the opportunity for education to keep growing, I think it's just quite exciting. And tell me about Duolingo, which is a fascinating company founded by Louise von Ahn, who's a really interesting character. Yeah, I remember having a conversation with Louise in the Duolingo IPO process and Super impressed by him with all of his achievements. I know for some of you who may know Louis, he was the inventor of CAPTCHA and ReCAPTCHA. But I think he, more impressive for me is that he's the person that wants to devote his entire life to education. His background as a 
you know, immigrants from Guatemala taught him the importance of education and equal access to education. So interestingly, a story that he received an offer from Microsoft to come and work for them directly from Bill Gates, but he refused because he wanted to be a teacher in computer science, like a professor in computer science at Carnegie Mellon. And later on, he founded Duolingo on the belief that he wants to provide the best education and make it universally available to everyone in the world. So not many people turned down Bill Gates. I think that gives an insight into how he's quite mission-driven as opposed to just profit-driven. Yeah, so we come back to that point about balancing profitability and mission. And I think Luis is the founder who always wants to strike that balance right. It took Duolingo a while to figure out the best monetization method. Because of the mission, he vowed not to ever charge for education content. So they come up with the subscription business in a similar way as Spotify, in which, of course, you can learn like language on Duolingo completely free. But if you want to remove some of the advertising and maybe learn a bit faster, then you subscribe for the premium service. And I think that is the, a great business model that hopefully that strike that balance right for it between missions and, and profitability. And you've tried the app. How did you find it? I'm a keen user. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm learning Chinese at the moment. And I just have to be honest that Chinese is not the best course, uh, language course on Duolingo. The flagship course is uh, the learning French and Spanish from English. And some of my team members tried it. And like I always received notification from Duolingo saying, oh, let's congrat that person because they achieve X and Y and Z. <laughs> so it's quite it's quite amazing how Duolingo keeps finding ways to make the app more sociable and keep pushing each other to, to learn more and learn better because at the end of the day for language you just have to keep practicing every day and keep coming back to to practicing it. There's almost an element of gamification there, isn't there? Yeah, Duolingo is best known for its gamification approach because learning language is hard, right? It requires a lot of motivation. So how to make people motivated to learn it every day? So Duolingo's think that by making it fun, making it like a game in which you, you're kind of like a treasure hunt, like you have to go through step by steps in order to get to something, right? So that gamification and making it fun, making each of the lessons really short, but effective, I think is the key differentiation point of Duolingo among a very crowded language app market out there. Yeah, I think you must be a lot more disciplined than me. <laughs> I mean, they have, a, they have a green owl, don't they? Almost like a push notification that pops up and reminds you, now's the time to do your course. Yeah, and sometimes if you forget, then the owls kind of got angry and say, oh, that doesn't work. I'm going to stop sending the message to you. <laughs> I think Duolingo has a huge library of messages completely designed by AI to send those notifications to, to learners. The other company you mentioned was FDM. What problem are they trying to solve? FDM is a British company. It involves in training and recruiting and placing people in companies that requires IT's expertise. And they provide that services to graduates or to ex-forces in returners to work. The problem that FDM is trying to solve is quite interesting because like we heard a lot about IT skill gaps and the conventional wisdom is that it is caused by the lack of IT graduates but it's actually not. The IT skill gap exists because to some extent because of the unhelpfulness of university degrees, even degrees in computer science in signaling the competencies in IT. And so for that reason, when companies employ, like recruit for employees, the main things that they seek for is the previous work experience of IT in a professional environment. And that is exactly what FDM provides them with. So in a way that FDM helps solve the mismatch between the supply in the demand for IT expertise and at the same time providing job opportunities for a cohort of individuals who may not otherwise have access to that opportunity. And what I'm interested in 
It's why you choose these companies in your portfolio as opposed to others and how you balance mission and profitability. There are lots of reasons why we chose these companies, right? I mean, but ultimately, I think the point about uh, balancing that missions and profitability is the key. They have all found a business model that works really well with a system that can make sustainable revenues and profitability in the future. And the helm of the company is, is really the management team that is committed to make that balance right. And it's not always easy. Like Coursera and, and Duolingo, it took them years to figure out that monetization method that they are having now. Duolingo, for example, Luis Vona always say that there's an easy way to make money. Right? You can bombard free users with advertising to induce them to switch to subscription. That will earn you high revenues in the short term, but that would just jeopardize the user experience in the long term. So they're not going to do that. An opposite example is Croton where she is a Brazilian tertiary education company focusing on low-income students. And that is a company that Positive Chain used to hold the shares, but we sold later on the ground that when things turn hard, in this case, is the regulatory environment changes, but the management team just pivoted its strategy and it no longer stayed true to the original mission. And so I definitely think that the management intent is a really important aspect of what we look for in those businesses. What's your own experience here, Taiha? You grew up in Vietnam. Has this shaped or informed your decision making at all? The experience in Vietnam is quite different from the ones that I think you have here. I studied in Vietnam till grade 11 before I come into the UK. And if I have to describe it, it was quite an intense one. Like typical Asian parents, they just have a lot of expectations for the kids. And so we were all sent to you know various different classes, private tutors, after school classes to study more. And in a way, as the Vietnamese education system is very similar to the Chinese education system before the government cracked down, if you are familiar with, with China. And so I think at that time, I cope well. But of course, if I have to choose again, then I would definitely prefer a less intensive one. That sounds quite intense. <laughs> you, you mentioned the crackdown in China on education there. Tell me a little bit more about that and your thoughts on that. Lots of different theories or even speculations on what is the ultimate um, Chinese government intention with the crackdown on education. One of the the most popular theory is that the education in you know all the private tutors after classes, exam prep course, English course have become a big financial burden for parents. And that has a direct impact because on worsening the inequality problem, because for obvious reasons that wealthier parents can afford more and better education for their kids. But it also have an impact on lowering the birth rate because education has become too expensive that affording schooling fees for one kid is difficult, not mentioning two or three kids. So what the Chinese government wants to do with that crackdown is that they want to create a more equitable society and also to encourage birth rate before you know the problems of China getting old before getting rich becomes worsened. So that's, that is the most popular theory. And if that is the case, then I think it should be very welcome. However, I, I'm personally a bit skeptical on how effective that crackdown would be because if you think about it, like the ultimate reason why the Chinese education existed in that way is because of their culture. Right? Parents just have lots of expectations on kids and they would try to do everything to push their kids to the top. So one way or the other, they would find new ways to do that. And culture is very slow to change. So I think it will be very interesting to see how the Chinese education system developed in the future. And I think to some extent, Vietnamese education could follow a similar path. That's just interesting. Quite a lot of correlations there. Thanks so much for joining us on Short Briefings on Long Term Thinking. Thanks, Malcolm. 
Thanks for investing your time in short briefings on long-term thinking. You can find our podcast at bailigiffy.com forward slash podcasts or subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify or on TuneIn. And if you enjoyed this conversation about how education is being transformed, check out previous discussions we've had on the podcast about disruption, such as how the messenger RNA vaccine could provide a solution, not just for COVID, but for cancer and other diseases. And also how the pandemic is changing the way we shop. Intrigued? There are 24 other episodes, so plenty to choose from. And if you're listening at home, you're listening in the car, wherever you're listening, stay well. And we look forward to bringing you more insights in our next podcast. Thank you.